This podcast is brought to you through our charitable partnership with Children's Home Society of North Carolina. Right now, there are more than 12,000 children living in the foster care system and not nearly enough safe, loving homes for them. Find out how you can make a difference today at chsnc.org. Welcome to the Simax Way, the definitive podcast for mastering finance, investment, and retirement planning. Prepare to unlock the secrets to financial success as we delve into lucrative investment strategies and provide expert guidance towards a secure retirement. With over 20 years of experience, Semax Financial Group has been dedicated to serving investors, and through this podcast, we aim to empower you with the knowledge to maximize your savings and achieve lasting financial freedom the Semax way. Whether you're a professional finance enthusiast, a high net worth individual, or part of a sophisticated investment group, this podcast is tailor-made for you. And now, here is your host, Matt Landon, financial advisor for Simax Financial Group and licensed CFP. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Simax Way. Today, we're going to dive into something that I think is a pretty fascinating topic and is not very well understood. We're, we're actually going to talk about IRA accounts, but I want to go over a few of the more nuanced details of them that I think people may be a little bit confused about. So I'm going to bounce around just a little bit. I'm going to talk about IRA accounts, and then I'm actually going to talk about 401ks as well, just a hair. So let's dive right in. Just as a recap, for those of you that aren't aware or maybe have forgotten, an IRA account is an account that is considered to be pre-tax funds. So these are dollars that you have put into the account and you've never paid taxes on. The time that it's in the account, it's going to be growing tax-free. And then when you pull it out, you have to pay income taxes. That's the way a lot of people understand IRA accounts. And that is accurate with a couple of notable exceptions. And that's actually what I want to dive into today is around some of these exceptions and some of the the things that that are a little bit different. Let's start off with one that's a little bit uh, less common, and that is around K-1. Now, for those of you that don't know, K-1s are a tax form. Now, it's used for business partnerships to report to the IRS a partner's income, losses, capital gains, dividends, that, that sort of thing. So what's coming from the partnership for the tax year? Now, with a K-1, a partner's earnings can be taxed at the individual tax rate versus the corporate tax rate. So that could be favorable for you if you're in a non-qualified account, say, and your your individual tax rate might be 12 or 15 percent versus the corporate tax rate, which could be higher than that. Where this gets interesting is around if you have K-1s that are issued inside of an IRA account. Now, the key thing with this is people assume my IRA account, I haven't pulled any money out. That means I shouldn't owe any taxes on it. That's accurate to a point. If an IRA account, if a position inside of that IRA account is producing K-1s, depending on the amount of that K-1 and where that box is, you know, depending on what box inside of that tax form is checked, you may actually be subject to taxes in that tax year for an investment inside of an IRA account. So that's that's pretty interesting, and a lot of people aren't aware of it. So I would just say with this, K-1s are something to be aware of inside of a non-qualified account as well as inside of an IRA. Some CPAs are not going to want to file your tax return until you have your final K-1s. Others say, well, it looks like we're going to be well under the limit, so we'll just go ahead and file off the estimated. We'll double check it with the, with the final K-1s. I would say that's a situation where you really want to be talking with your tax prepare. But K-1s are a interesting tax form that can cause an IRA account to incur taxable income to you without you withdrawing any funds out. So K-1s are something I would, I would start off with and say around IRA accounts are a little less understood. Here's another thing. With an IRA account, when you're originally putting that money in, it's going in tax-free. It's, it's coming off of your income tax return. This is accurate provided your income is below the limits. So if you have too much income in a given year, you can still contribute to your IRA. However, you do not get that tax deduction in the year you put it in. 
for this uh, coming up 2024, the numbers are going to be a little bit different than they were in 2023. So it's always important to look at those numbers at any given year. But for 2023, for example, if a married couple filing jointly made $218,000 or less, you got a full deduction. If you had more than $218,000 in income, but less than two hundred and twenty eight, dollars you got a partial deduction depending on where you landed. And if you make more than $228,000, you would get no deduction. So what's interesting around that is it's not saying you can't contribute to the IRA account, but what it is saying is you did not get that deduction. So let's play this out. What this means is you now have an IRA account if you're in that situation that has a combination of pre-tax dollars and post-tax dollars in it. So this is where the pro rata rule comes into play. What's interesting about that is it is the responsibility of the account holder to keep track of those post-tax dollars or it's going to end up being reported as pre-tax and you essentially are paying taxes, you're paying income taxes on those dollars twice. So keep that in mind. If I contribute to an IRA account and I have a $6,000 contribution and this year it's tax free and next year I do a $6,000 contribution and it's not, well, there's $12,000 in that account. Half of it you have already paid income taxes on. Half of it you have not. If you don't keep track of this and you pull that $12,000 out, the IRS is going to tax you on the whole thing. So this is a case where you really want to be paying attention to this. Now, unfortunately, you cannot just go in there and scoop out specifically the pre-tax dollars. This is where what, what happens is the pro rata rule. So you can look that up at the pro rata rule. Basically, what the pro rata rule says is, if you have a percentage of your account being pre-tax and a percentage of your account being post-tax, when you scoop money out of that account, you're scooping it out proportionately. I want you to think about this. This is the best way I can think of describing it. If you're somebody that has all pre-tax dollars inside of your IRA, it's like you're sitting there with a cup of black coffee. When you take a sip of coffee, it's all coffee. It's all pre-tax dollars. Now, let's say you're the kind of person that enjoys two creamer in your coffee. You like your coffee, but you put two creamer in there. You know you put two creamers in that coffee. And when you drink the entire cup, you have drunk two creamers. However, if you were to, to stir it up really good and then go, you know what? I am just going to pull a little bit of black coffee out. I'm going to leave all the creamer in there. Or I'm just going to pull out some of the creamer. I'm going to leave the coffee alone. You can't do it. It's all, it's all blended together. It's all, it's all mixed up. And so what you're saying is if I drank half the cup after putting two creamer in there, I can tell you I've drunk one creamer and a half a cup of black coffee, but you can't filter them out. Does this make sense? So the key thing when you're thinking of a pro rata rule, you want to be paying attention to do I have pre-tax and post-tax dollars and, and you each year. You have to make sure you're allocating those funds appropriately. So um, the pro rata rule, well underrepresented, doesn't come up a huge amount, but it is pretty interesting and I really like it. I'd like to pause a minute and just express our gratitude to our podcast sponsors, Nobles Food and Pursuits. This renowned restaurant group has been serving the community for an impressive 40 years, starting with Jim Noble's original restaurant, J. Basil Noble in High Point. Over the years, their passion for hospitality has flourished, leading them to expand into a diverse collection of nine restaurants, a retail bakery, and a catering company. Today, we want to shine a spotlight on one of their beloved establishments, Rooster's A Noble Grill, which has been proudly open for 31 years right here in Winston-Salem. Now, Rooster's is known for its commitment to offering a seasonally inspired, regionally cultivated menu featuring mouth-watering wood-fired meats, poultry, and vegetables. If you're looking for a delightful dining experience, they also host monthly wine dinners and provide live music on their inviting patio every Tuesday night. Now, make sure to pay them a visit at 380 Knollwood Street, and to secure your spot, head over to theroosterskitchen.com and make a reservation. Again, that's roosterskitchen.com. Trust us, 
you won't want to miss the delectable dishes and warm ambiance that Roosters has to offer. Now, let's continue exploring the world of finance and uncovering some strategies to help you achieve your financial goals. So at this point, we've talked about how an IRA account could be taxable without pulling money out of it. We have also talked about how an IRA account, you could pull money out of it without paying taxes, even though it's not a Roth because you've already paid those taxes. So let's talk about how you would end up not paying taxes out of an IRA when it comes time for RMDs. For those of you who are not familiar, an RMD just stands for a required minimum distribution. There are some custodians, which are just places where your money is held, that might call it an MRD or a mandatory minimum distribution or a mandatory required distribution. Uh, There's a lot of different variations of, of how places call it, but the most generally accepted term is an RMD. They have changed the rules a little bit, and by they, I mean the government. The rules have changed a little bit on when you have to take an RMD. It used to be 70 and a half, the year in which you turn 70 and a half. Now, it is up to 73, and depending on the year you're born, that changes a little bit more. We'll do a whole episode on RMDs, and and we can talk through how that works and the tax laws around that and how uh, it's looking at age and, and what we can do to minimize some of that tax burden. But what I want to talk about today is around a QCD. That's a qualified charitable distribution. So a QCD. QCD sounds like uh, like the money's going to charity. And that's exactly right. So this is a distribution that's coming out of your IRA account. But instead of it going to you, it is going directly to a charity. You cannot do this and get that benefit until you are 70 and a half. So you have to wait until you're 70 and a half. But at that point in time, you have the ability to to gift funds out of your IRA account directly to a charity. Now, this could be the church. This could be a mission board. This could be an animal shelter. There's not really a restriction around that as far as, like, oh, it has to specifically be this type of charity. It does need to be a legitimate charity. It has to be an actual organization. I've heard some folks have said, oh, well, my kids are my charity. Yes, I can understand that. That's not where this applies. This is specifically talking about a a legitimate charitable organization. But what you can do is you can gift funds directly to that charity. Uh, This does count towards an RMD. Uh, It does not trigger any kind of, of tax burden for you. So it counts towards that RMD, but it keeps your taxable income lower. This is a huge benefit if you're right there on the border or kind of close when you're looking at Medicare premiums, particularly if you are doing the standard deduction, you're going to get the standard deduction whether you gift $5,000 to the church or not. So if you can take that $5,000 off of your income by gifting it out of that IRA directly to the church and then still get that full standard deduction, that's that's a way to maximize your savings in your, in your IRA account. And I think that's huge. Uh, I'm a big fan of not giving uncle Sam anymore. We have to now, of course, this along with everything else, you want to run it by your CPA or tax professional, make sure you're getting the, the best advice and everything's above board and you're doing what's right for you. But I do believe a QCD is something that could be utilized and would be incredibly valuable. And another thing to keep in mind here with your IRA account And this is where, again, I think it's underutilized. But for those of you that are more charitably inclined, this could be huge. What I want to talk about right now is around beneficiaries. So take a step back and think about estate taxes. Right now, the estate tax, you can pass a little over $12 million out of your estate to your beneficiaries without incurring estate taxes. That's per spouse, and uh, you have an unlimited amount you can pass between spouses. So my wife is named Kristen. If I were to pass away, my entire estate can go to Kristen. Well, Kristen then, because I did not use any of that free amount going to beneficiaries, that $12 million I could pass on stacks with her $12 million. So it's, it's not 12, it's actually a little bit more. So what that means is Kristen would be able to leave a little over $24 million to a beneficiary without paying estate taxes. 
Now, for most of us, that's not a number we need to be too concerned about. Others are. And if you're in that situation, there's some really interesting and creative things you can do. But for most of us, we're well under that $24 million mark. So we go, why, why am I worried about estate taxes? Here's why. If you leave $100,000 out of your estate to a beneficiary, they get $100,000. Now, if you leave $100,000 out of your IRA to a beneficiary, then that beneficiary has to pay income taxes on it. Because whether you pay the income taxes or your beneficiary pays the income taxes, someone is going to have to pay income taxes on those funds when they come out. And for beneficiaries, they've changed the rules again. Beneficiaries can no longer do a stretch IRA where you can stretch that inherited IRA out over 15 or 20 or 30 and 40 years. You only have 10 years to take those funds out. Now, if you're on average, let's just say conservatively, your kids or your beneficiary is in a 15% federal, 5% state tax bracket. If you leave them $100,000 inside of that IRA, they're going to walk away with $80,000 in their pocket. They have to pay those federal and those state taxes. So think about this. If you leave money in your will, if your plan right now is I'm going to update my will or I've got my will set up to where I'm leaving money to a charity. Let's say it's the animal shelter. Now, my wife and I, we are big animal lovers. We have rescued multiple dogs. We actually have a foster dog at our home right now. She's a beautiful two-year-old golden retriever. Absolutely love her. Well, if we passed away and we said inside of our will, we're going to leave $100,000 to the Golden Retriever Rescue Foundation, the foundation would end up with $100,000. Now, if I said I want to leave that same $100,000 to a family member, they would end up with $100,000. But if I took that IRA account, that pre-tax money, and I said I want to leave that $100,000 to a family member, after taxes, remember, they're going to walk away with about $80,000. If instead... I did not have the Rescue Foundation in our will, but I had it as a beneficiary on the IRA, then the IRA would leave $100,000 to the Rescue Foundation. They end up with $100,000. So I think it's kind of interesting how if you are charitably inclined, I'm not saying don't leave money to charities, but leaving it in a will may not be the best way to do it. Now, of course, I'm going to give you a caveat here. I told you earlier, I'm not a tax professional. I'm also not an attorney. I'm a financial advisor. I don't want to step outside of my wheelhouse. But when we're talking about how to maximize things, you really want to make sure that you're working with a financial professional who's also working with your taxes, that you've got these things in, in alignment, and that you're also looking at your legal and you've got a whole legal team that's working together. You can think about it as a, as a quarterback, there are going to be times where the quarterback's going to hold on to the ball and throw it. There are going to be times where they're going to hand it off to the running back. There's going to be times where they uh, do uh, call an audible in the middle of a play and say, well, we were going to do this, but we're changing it. You, you, you want your financial advisor to be kind of quarterbacking things for you. So when it comes to K-1s, that's the kind of thing where if you bring that up and say, hey, is there a way that my investments could be taxable inside of my IRA? If your advisor goes, no, that's not possible. Go, wait a minute. What about K-1s? If they give you a blank stare, that should throw up a little bit of a, a red flag for you and say, OK, what is this guy doing? Is he is he staying on top of current laws? Is he staying on top of rules? Same thing with the pro rata rule. I think it's really important that your financial advisor not be attempting to give you tax advice. But at the same time, your financial advisor does need to understand how your investments and how your things being set up the way they are impact your tax return, not just today, but also into the future. So those were just a few thoughts that I had around IRA accounts that are a little bit outside of the norm that I don't think are discussed quite as much. I just wanted to run through them with you. If you're interested in more information, if you'd like to hear more 
Of course, this is the kind of thing where the advisors at the Semax team are glad to talk through that and, and help and assist. Uh, in future episodes, we're going to dive into some really cool stuff around 401k plans. I'll just throw you a teaser trailer. Uh, I really want to talk to you all about 401k plans and how Quadros work. That's a QRDO, uh, as well as some some other nuanced things around that. Um With 401k plans, there's kind of four main areas that we'll dive into when you're younger, when you're kind of middle aged, when you're stepping into retirement, and then when you're when you're creating income, when you're pulling from them out during retirement. So you have different challenges and nuances around them. I hope this has been beneficial. I always enjoy doing this on behalf of the Semax team and and myself. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it. As always, we're going to dive in again and take another piece of the pie and keep on taking it off one bite at a time. We're just going to enjoy as we go. On behalf of the Semax team, my name's Matt Landon. I am a CFP. It's been a pleasure. I always enjoy doing this. I hope you have found it valuable as well. So thanks for listening and I look forward to our next discussion. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Semax Way. If you're not completely satisfied with your current financial advisor, give us a call for a second opinion. Please note that this podcast is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only. The content shared on the Semax Way should not be considered as investment advice. It is always recommended consult your licensed investment representative and a competent tax advisor respectively for your fiduciary needs and plans. No statement contained in the Semax Wade podcast or made by its producers, sponsors, host Matt Landon or Semax Financial Group is a recommendation. Semax Financial Group and Matt Landon are not responsible or liable for investment value loss of any kind from any action taken based on information discussed in the Semax Way podcast. Any opinions or viewpoints in this podcast are shared for information and entertainment purposes only and are not financial advice. We do encourage you to conduct further research and seek personalized advice for your specific financial circumstances. Full disclosure available at Semex.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to having you tune in for future episodes of The Semex Way.